Hello everyone. This is your opening lecture for History 11, Los Angeles City College, and I am your professor, Dr. Gabriel Selassie. I am excited about this first lecture because we have a lot of things that we're going to talk about, um, and we're going to try to put them into a box of probably about 35, 45 minutes. I'm going to try my level best to get us there. I doubt very much if this is going to take more than an hour, but sometimes you never know. There are things that come up as I'm giving the lecture that might impede us from limiting the amount of time. But nevertheless, we'll try to get it under the 45-minute time period. Now, what's fascinating about this particular lecture is that it's hoping, at least I'm hoping that what we'll do as we proceed forward is this lecture will be the basis by which you do just about all of the material for the entire course. So this lecture is exceptionally important to you all because the things that you will learn here, you will have to carry forward in your future assignments. Now, I'm hoping that the recording sound is going to come out pretty clear. I have the volumes turned up, but I did notice that when I tested this lecture that the sound was fairly low. I'm actually doing this on a computer that I normally don't use, but, in, but for anything but basically uh, reading and writing emails and doing small things. I generally don't use this for more of the production. But nevertheless, we're here and I'm giving this lecture and hopefully the sound will be adequate. If it's not, you can always turn the sound up. Now, let's begin with our material. And as we get started, the very first and the most important question that we have to ask ourselves is what exactly is history? Probably when you were in high school, you probably took a history course, and it probably, for all intents and purposes, was not taught by a historian. Many times in high schools, what they do is, is that a person will get a bachelor's degree in a subject like social studies, and they will get a teaching credential in something like history or politics or English or something, and then since they have that credential, then that will allow them to be able to teach. The problem with that is, of course, is a person has no real specialty in history, and the person isn't grounded in any methodology. The idea being is that for a person in high school, you really don't need to know the methodologies and get grounded in history. What you need to know are the events of that particularly uh, that particular subject. So, for example, in the, of European history, you would learn about the rise of the Roman Empire and then the fall of Francia and the rise of England and Great Britain. You would learn Napoleon. You would just learn just a basic sort of an overview of history. And then when you got to college, you would hone down on that a little bit more and then that would give you the basis by which your history education was basically comprised. Now, the, really, the, the main problem that most of us professional historians have with all of this is because there are so many things that are not taught because people are, just don't have the opportunity to take those classes in college because they have to take English and mathematics and science and so many other things that they only get what we call sort of a cliff note version of history, and then they are turned on to pass that on to you. So probably, most likely, if you went to just an average high school like I did, you probably didn't get any grounding in actually what is history, and you probably were never asked to even think about it. Now, if that's not the case, if you were asked this question, and you did have to ponder this, for example, you might have been in AP history, then that's a whole different ball game. You're way ahead of the curve, and that's kudos for you. We'll give you a clap one time for you. Um, but just generally, basically, it is fairly unlikely that you've had that. And even if you did have it in AP history, you've probably just scratched the surface, but it will help you a lot as we move forward. So what we're going to do here is we're going to talk about this concept about what is history, and for the most part, just a basic rough outline is that history is 
foremost, above anything else, a study of the past. Now, what does this really mean? So our operative words here, of course, are study, which is a descriptive word, and past, which is an actual thing. So we have to kind of break these two things down, and what we're going to do is we'll, as we proceed further, we're actually going to do that. Now, who are its caretakers? History actually has caretakers, and those people are professional historians. Now, so what we're dealing with here are just two very basic concepts here. One of them is, is that we have this thing which is a study of a particular thing, and then we have people who are the caretakers, the people responsible for the maintenance and care of that study of that thing. So generally speaking, professional historians are the caretakers of the study of the past. And we will go into some detail about how does one become a professional historian. So you'll have some overall feeling when you see a history book or you have to read one when you're matriculating through college. You'll have a really good sort of understanding about what it took to basically get that book written by this professional historian or by this caretaker. Now, why history is important? It's important because history is sort of a roadmap. It is a roadmap to tell you who you are as a person and as a people. So we can think of this from the standpoint is that if we wiped away everything someone knew about, you gave yourself sort of what we would call a historical collective amnesia, that everything that happened to you that led up to you being in this classroom were completely wiped out, would you be the same person? You are the person you are because all of the sum total of all the decisions that you've made in life have culminated in you being in front of your computer watching this video. The decision to come to LA City College and to take this class is part of your historical makeup and there will be documents that will substantiate the fact that you, in fact, took this class, right? So we can say this much about you without knowing anything. You are a seeker of knowledge, right? So there is a path word that led you here that if we didn't know anything else, we could say that you are a person who wanted to be educated and to get an education. It will also tell you about where you have been. Now, there is no requirement that you have to have a high school diploma to come to college, right? Generally speaking, you can go to community college without a high school diploma. But there will be, again, signposts in the way that will basically tell us how you got here. So, for example, by and large, probably a good number of you either have a GED or a high school diploma. So that is a marker. Right, So I can say that with all assurity that you probably went to high school at some particular point, even if you didn't finish and you got a GED, you were at least there. Right, So you have some modicum of education, and then again, those are signposts. Now, this is the important part, I think, about history, is that it also works to tell us where you are going. So in other words, what we can deduce from this fact is that if you're on this journey for an education, what you're probably seeking is to probably be gainfully employed. And let's just say hypothetically that you're not interested in being gainfully employed, that you just want education for education's sake. What you've decided is to go on a pilgrimage of education. And that probably if you're just doing this for the knowledge that you are probably a lifelong learner and you will probably forever, like I am, will always be in college. All right, so I started college in 1980 and I finished my last degree in 2017. So you can figure out from 1980 to 2017, I have been working a lot in obtaining more knowledge. And with that, sometimes it comes with degrees. So you can probably rest assured if you look at the number of degrees that I have that you probably will venture 
that at some particular point in my future that I probably will take another class. As a matter of fact, I am a University of Southern California Trojan, right? I was accepted and admitted over the last year to work on a doctorate in education at the University of Southern California. And most people who know me say that that was pretty much expected because I love learning things. So from that perspective, you can look at a person's past, study their past, and make these determinations about who they are, where they have been, and where they are going. And that's why history is important. That's why the world spends an inordinate amount of time on the manufacturing of historical products because these things are greatly important. And as we move, I will show you an example of how. Now, what we need to do at this particular point is conceptualize the past. Now, we kind of think when I say things like the past, we mean something that happened previous to whatever is going on now. So now is a kind of a relative sort of thing because every moment that I speak, things change. It's sort of like the Native American saying that you can never step into the same river twice, that every second that we're here, that second clicks off and it becomes a product of the past. So it's kind of hard to nail down exactly what we mean by the past, the future, but just in relative sense, let's just think about it in terms of days. So, and from that particular standpoint, what we can say here is that we can conceptualize the past as things that happened previously than what's going on in our present moment or today. Okay, and so we can conceptualize tomorrow as being our future. Now, what's important about this is, is that we actually had to create the concept of the past. Now, I know exactly what you're thinking. You're saying to yourself, what do you mean by that? That doesn't make sense. Now, think about this for a moment. If you found yourself several millennia on the savannah lands of Africa with a small band of your cousins and your children and your parents, and what you did is that you moved with animals, you probably were not thinking about the past as much as you would if you are living in a modern day society with the kind of trappings that we have. What you probably are only thinking about is that yesterday you were hungry and after today that you've caught an animal, you are full. So you probably didn't relatively think about generally lots of things that happened earlier. You might have thought about the time when your child was born or when you were almost gored by an animal. But just generally speaking, what you are probably doing is thinking about the here and now and your survival. Now, as humans began to create civilization, as things became much more complicated, as people became much, much more richer, and as we became more sedentary, people then began to talk about and thinking about the past, especially when we had to deal with warring states. And why this is, is because we would have to understand what things worked that kept us safe and what things didn't work. So with that, we probably had to talk a lot about the last time we were engaged in battle and what things went well and what things didn't go so well. So from that standpoint, what I'm making the argument here is that at one particular point in our history, the past really didn't matter that much. Now, there's probably no way to really know this because certainly people who lived a millennia ago certainly didn't write things down and there's no recordings of what they're saying. But we can probably just conceptualize that things were probably a lot less complicated than they are today. So from this particular standpoint, once we needed a reliable source of the past, where we went wrong, what we did right, 
then what this then does is it opens up for us the future. So what we can argue here is that we can never have a future unless we have a past. And certainly when we have a past, a future, then we can conceptualize the importance of our ever present. So for example, if we were looking at something like Buddhism, right, and studying Buddhism, we can ever know that the present, living in the present, and not living in the future, not living in the past, is really important. Now, what this does for us when we have this idea of the past and the future and the present, it then brings in this concept of progress. Because we can look back where we were and make a determination through data that there have been real changes in our society. Now, let me say this as a caveat. Historians primarily are not interested in the future. Historians are not interested in the present. What we are primarily interested in is the past. The future, yeah, we think about the how will things unfold, but our primary terrain, where we work, is with the past. Futurists, political scientists, sociologists, other groups are interested in the future, but primarily those fields that are associated with history, like anthropology and archaeology, are primarily interested in the past. Now, the main problem with conceptualizing this concept of the past is to define what is it. Now, why I say this is because everybody has their own particular way of looking at things. My way of assessing a situation can be totally and diametrically different from the way that you're conceptualing something. So, for example, two people with two different vantage points can see an incident and walk away from that very same incident with totally two depictions of what exactly happened. Now, if we were to make this a little bit more complicated, we can layer this with the fact that, let's say that I'm much more taller than you are, and I see it from a different vantage point, or if I'm standing on the other side of the street, or let's just say that I am wealthier, poorer, or that I am a woman or a man, or whether or not I am religious or not religious. There are so many things that make up you and make up the way that you understand things that you can have two people standing together who see the same thing that walk away from an event with totally two different conceptions of what happened. So you can have a situation anytime where no two people can ever agree on the events. Now, when I was a child in elementary school, we used to play this thing called the telephone game. I'm not sure if any of you played that, but if you had, it is one of the most fascinating things that happened. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the telephone game, it's a simple game where you line people up and you tell the first person who's standing in the front of the line something like there are three small trees in a forest, and that person then has to relay that information to the next person. And what usually happens here is that by the time it gets into the middle, instead of going from there are three small trees in a forest, that there are 12 elephants who reside in the valley of the Sahara Kalahari Desert in the North Pole who are waiting for Santa Claus to arrive. This is the same thing that happens with history. Think about this for a moment. The problem that you will have in societies who don't rely on written testimony. They rely on oral testimony as many societies do in the East. So what happens here? You have to have a system in these societies where there can be no deviation from what story is being handed down from one person to the next. 
Now, you know intuitively from the telephone game that that can be problematic. But then again, what happens in the case of writing? Does writing ever change? Let's say that someone saw an event and wrote about it, and then someone else picked up that writing and wrote about it, and then someone picked up the second writing and wrote about it, and so on and so on, until we got to the hundredth writing, would that writing change? I would venture to say in both cases, both the oral history and the written history, they are both subject and prone to error because no two people are likely to see the same thing. Or what happens just in general if a person sees the event in the same way that you saw the event, right? That there were three elephants walking down a street dressed in red, wearing top hats and canes, but you have two different interpretations as to why that happened. You might argue that there was a train wreck and the elephants got loose. Someone else might make the hypothesis that my baby sister went and dressed up those three elephants in top hats and canes. So this is why the caretakers of history are important to history. How do we in fact know something that happened in the past actually happened. So this leads us to this overall concept about the credibility of history. How do we know things occurred? How do we think we saw them? You weren't there. I wasn't there. None of us are living on the planet today were there for the French Revolution, for the American Revolution. And also, let's just say that, for example, I was there when people landed on the moon. And if you were to come and ask me what exactly did I see, I would have to remember all of that information about what happened. Now, I can tell you a lot of things that I do remember, but there were probably tons of things that I absolutely do not remember. So how reliable is my memory? How reliable is your memory? How do you not know that the person who's being asked is not a person who was alive and living in the Soviet Union who were racing to beat us into space and who actually did beat us. We beat the Russians to the moon, but the Russians beat us into space, and they may tell you a totally different story. The Russians, for a long time, during the era of the Soviet Union, had lots of propaganda that they would often state they invented the light bulb. They discovered electricity. There were so many things that they took credit for. Now, of course, these were all absurdities, but nevertheless, people who were living in Russia who were being taught this kind of thing actually thought that to be true. So then we have a problem here about our senses, about what we see, what we can we remember. So if our memories are not clear, how credible can we say history is? And who gets to make that determination? Now, Napoleon was a student of history, right, who came to power after the French Revolution in 1789. History, Napoleon was particularly interested in the idea that history can be flawed. And he said that history is a set of lies agreed upon. There were other people like George Santa Anna who said history is a pack of lies about events that never happened told by people who weren't there. Now, both of these giants in our world history, right, offer us something that we ought to be aware of, that sometimes things that we read in history are absolutely incorrect. I read them all the time on Facebook. There was one actually that I was reading today where the assertion was just so fantastical that I had to chime in on Facebook and just tell people this is an absurdity. But people will believe all, all kinds of things. That's where we get the concept today of fake news. So we can see from this what we need to think as we move through this course and you begin to do the work is how credible is the history that you are reading. George Washington, 
right, is standing here in his long green coat and he's pulling back the curtain. And what he's doing here in this painting is that he's pulling back the curtain on his past life. Now, if you've never heard the story here, the story goes like this. George Washington, who became the United States first president, was a young boy and he chopped down one of his father's cherry trees. His father came to him and said, what happened to one of my cherry trees? And George Washington is alleged to have said, Father, I cannot tell a lie. I cut down the cherry tree. This is a story that I learned when I was in elementary school a long time ago, long probably before most of you were born. And I believed this story until I started studying history and I realized that this itself did not happen. It was a complete fabrication. The story was invented to make George Washington look a lot better than he was. George Washington was a self-serving, miserable slave owner. Now, we give him credit, right, for doing things like winning the victory over the British and helping to create an American nation, but he was a wretched, miserable slave owner who treated his slaves really badly. So this was an attempt to whitewash George Washington and try to fabricate a life about him that didn't exist. Patrick Henry once was quoted as saying, give me liberty or give me death. Patrick Henry spent the rest of his life telling people he never said that. But it's mythologized in writings and mythologized in this painting here of him. And he said, that's all fine and dandy, but I never said that. This was again fabricated to make the American patriots look special, that they would be willing to risk their lives, and many were, but they were. this was meant to make them look like they were willing to risk their lives, all for country. This is the story of, or the painting of Davy Crockett and the story of Davy Crockett at the Alamo in 1836 and the Texas Rebellion against Mexico and which directly resulted in the founding of the Texas Republic and also the mythologizing and the hero worshiping of Davy Crockett who perished during this battle. Davy Crockett was already well known and famous and he had been a congressman, Indian fighter and bear wrestler and all those kinds of wonderful things. There you can see him holding up his rifle in his bearskin coat, a suit, outfit with the fringes and beating up the Mexican army single-handedly almost, right? He's out of ammunition here, but that doesn't stop him. And this never happened as depicted. The Alamo was surrounded and bludgeoned, and Davy Crockett died a miserable life, and that fort was taken within hours. And he wasn't standing there clubbing all of these Mexicans over the head with his rifle, a total fabrication. This painting is so fabricated that they have him wearing a coonskin hat and a leather-skinned outfit, and Davy Crockett didn't wear either of those. As a matter of fact, when he was in Washington, D.C., working as a congressman, he went to a play about himself, and he said he couldn't recognize the person on stage acting like him because he said, I didn't wear those clothes. Davy Crockett wore regular clothes, regular pants, regular shirt, and a top hat. That's the, but this mythologizing of American heroes has been standard because we want to say things like these people were fighting for honor and liberty. And what these people in the Alamo were fighting for is the ability to keep slaves. The president of Mexico, the dictator at the time, was George Santa Anna, not the Santa Anna that I referred to in the earlier lecture, but another Santa Anna. And this leader of Mexico stated that slavery was outlawed in Mexico and Americans who were coming into the territory could not bring their slaves. And if they did, they had to free them. And so the white Americans who were coming in with their black slaves were protesting this idea that that was a seizure of property, a violation of their rights. And so they staged a revolution. So this is what I think Santa Anna and people like 
Napoleon are arguing here. Here's another one, Paul Revere's ride. One if by land and two if by sea. There were actually three riders who were sent out along with Paul Revere to warn the Americans that the British were coming to take back its arsenal. And what they were to do here is they were to ride and tell people if the British were coming in by ship or coming in by land. I learned this st story as a kid as well, and I believed it, that Paul Revere was some kind of a national hero. And to be honest, what happened to Paul Revere is that he got lost and captured, that there were other people like William Dawes who made the journey. But there was the poem, The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere, William Dawes and his other companion were completely forgotten. Now, what does this say about history, about the way that we conceptualize the past? William Dawes, who should have been a hero, who made the journey, was not mythologized, but the man who was captured was. And largely the reason for this was because the person who wrote the poem, The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere, tried to write The Midnight Ride of William Dawes, and he said it just didn't rhyme well enough, so he changed it from William Dawes to Paul Revere. This is another one that you may or may not have heard of, and this is Betsy Ross. Betsy Ross's family stated for generations that Betsy created the first American flag, and this is not true. The family fabricated this whole angle, the story. She probably made a flag at one point, and, but there were several other people making flags. She was not the first person to make the American flag. Total fabrication. Now, if we know that we're suffering and stretching and trying to make sure that the history that we learned is credible, why is history so important? It's important as George Santayana, not the George, not the Santa Ana, the one that I talked about at the Alamo. George Santa Ana was a professor at Harvard University in the 19th century. George Santa Ana here said, those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. In other words, what Santa Ana was arguing here was that you need to learn about history so you don't make the same repeated mistakes. Who was it? I think it was it Einstein, if my memory served me, said something to the nature of insanity is basically doing the same thing and it not working and expecting different results, right? I think this is what Santa Anna is trying to argue here. Marcus Tilius Cicero, who was a Roman orator, once said, to be ignorant of what occurred before you were born, is to remain forever a child. For what is worth of human life, unless it is woven into the life of our ancestors by the records of history? And I think that this is an appropriate statement by Cicero, that part of a liberal education is that you do study the past to educate yourself to grow as a person out of your humble beginnings into an educated man or a woman. Now, what I have bold in here is this idea of records, and you should underline that in your notes, and kind of think about this conception because it is readily important about records, which we'll talk about in a moment. Now, let's take a look at this idea of those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. This is a movie poster by an Italian director, uh, Ponta Corvo, who made some pretty decent movies. And this one was about the Battle of Algiers. And what the Battle of Algiers was, was about the country of Algeria, who was trying to wrestle their freedom from the French. They had been colonized by the French, and the people who lived in this region wanted their freedom from colonization. And so the movie is a depiction of one of the most important battles in this movement for independence by the Algerians. Now, why this is important, why this battle of Algeria is important, is because of our invasion of Iraq during the Iraq War. And this is a depiction of a soldier right in the middle of chaos, an American soldier. 
What we thought before the war, that we would go into this war and we would be hailed as liberators and we would be able to come in, find the weapons of mass destruction and liberate the people and take over the country. And as soon as we came into Iraq, the country melted down. There were no weapons of mass destruction. We were led into a lie over oil and the country fell into chaos. And today, even the war's been over for years, it's still a fairly chaotic country. Now, why this is important is because the administration at the time, George Bush, Dick Cheney, George Bush president, Dick Cheney vice president, they completely didn't understand history and completely miscalculated. Had they known about the Battle of Algeria, they would have understood that it would have been immensely difficult for a foreign occupying force to come into a country and try to subdue the, and subjugate those people. Here in this photo, you're seeing the French on one side with the tanks and the men standing in with helmets and batons and the people of Algeria in a natural uprising. And I will say to you today, if you are interested in finding out what happened, the, of course, the Algerians won this war. Finding out what happened, you can easily watch the movie. It's quite entertaining. We should have known and understood something about Vietnam. Those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Now, let's move on a little bit. We get our understanding of history from very ancient sources going back before Common Era, or BC, as it's otherwise known, with people like the Greeks and others, the Chinese, Africans as well, and other groups who were trying to come to grips with this idea of progress and the past. For people in the West, we look to people like Herodotus, a Greek in the 5th century BC, who is the first acknowledged Western historian. Now, we wouldn't recognize his, Herodotus's work as history today. We wouldn't accept it because there were many things that were not what we would say appropriate about the way that he constructed the past. But nevertheless, he was the first person in the West that we can think of that was moving towards trying to come to grips with things that happened in our past. And so this new forms of writing, what Herodotus taught us is that history should teach us good examples to follow, sort of what the idea of what George Santa Anna was talking about. We also have people like Ibn Khaldun, who was writing in the 14th century common era, who introduced this scientific method to the philosophy of history, a new society, what we call the new science. And what we mean by a scientific method of history is that we should not take things as superstition and that we must use historical data to inform ourselves on what the past is. And that concept, historical data, will be important for us as we move forward. Then we get this concept of, as we're moving towards modern history, is that history is seen as linear and irreversible. This is in the West. So, for example, in the East, I would say, and particularly in places like, say, India, history is not linear. It's cyclical, and what goes around comes around, so to speak. We also, in the modern world, we think of history conceived of what we call the dialectic. And the dialectic is this concept called the thesis and antithesis. And what we mean by this is someone makes a claim about the past, and then there is an alternative, different narrative about that same event, sort of like the two elephants walking down the street, and then there is a contestation between these two ideas, and out of it comes a totally new idea. So maybe instead of having, say, three elephants walking down the street with top hats, and someone else seeing three, 
elephants walking down the street with, let's say, canes, we eventually realized that the elephants had top hats and canes. So we get a thesis, a rebuttal to that thesis, and then something else comes out of that. Then we have this idea, what we call the materialist conception of history. And this was given to us by Karl Marx, the famous writer of the Communist Manifesto, who argued that we measure progress through things tangible. So in other words, all we have to do is look at how humans have constructed society, the, the tangible things that we have. And we can say that from generation to generation, this has been a story of man's progress on Earth. Right. The other idea here embedded in this concept of the materialist approach or Marxist approach to history is that it's not simply enough to just study the history for history's sake, but we study history to bring about change. And that's the idea of progress. So for Marx, what he's talking about, just to give you an idea here, is that the rise of capitalism showed class conflict within a society, bringing about a new epoch, new epoch in world history. The father of modern history was a man by the name of Leopold von Rock, 1795 to 1886, who was the father of modern source-based history. What Ronk offered us was three basic things. One, that we should rely on primary sources. And this is the idea about the things that we are going to study, the data. He also argued that knowledge should come from sensory experience, that you ought to see things, to touch things, to go look for yourself. And the third thing is, is that good history writing is narrative-based writing. And what we mean by that is, is that we want to tell a story. So this is why writing in history is ultimately really important and why we write history books and why historians give so much importance on history books is because history as conceived in the modern West is based on this idea of storytelling with sources. Now, we have this concept of storytelling in the East, and that is those people who were the seers and the storytellers of oral history. But for us in the West, we use written sources. Now, I just want to go over just a couple of concepts here that we have over the last number of years that have come into this lexicon of history. One of them is a concept that we call Eurocentric history that we must be aware of, particularly in my classes. Now, you've, I don't know if you've heard this statement that people will say things like, yeah, history, it's his story. What we mean by that is, is that obviously history is written by people who have the means to write history. And oftentimes history is written by the victors. Now, for the last half of the modern epoch, so we can see this rising around, let's say, the 14th to the present, 14th century to the present, Europe and America have largely dominated world affairs. So it's a small time in world history, but certainly in our lifetimes, the United States and Europe have essentially dominated the world. We are beginning to see the rise of China and the Asian nations and also the wealth of Africa. But still, by and large, our epoch has been dominated by Europe and America. What this has meant is that since the idea of the printing press developed during this time period in Europe, Europeans and later Americans began to dominate the writing of history. What happened is early on is that these writings of history often favored Europeans. So we call this Eurocentric history. So let's go back to this concept that we have of two people looking at two different things. 
let's say that everybody who's in the East, and what I mean by the East is people who are in second and third world countries, so the continent of Africa, the continent of Asia, the continent of most of the Americas would be the East or second and third world countries. And Europe, the America, Australia, Canada, probably maybe Japan, Korea are first world or Western countries. So in this conception, this model that I'm speaking of, we have a concept here where you have these elephants walking down the street. And then we have people in the East on one side and we have people in the West on the other side. And they see this same phenomenon from two different vantage points. The European vantage point of history dominated. So what I mean by this is that when we look at, let's say, how the Native Americans were wiped off the North American continent, we didn't call that genocide. We call that manifest destiny or American expansion, an ocean-bound republic, sea to shining sea. We reveled in the idea that America was conquering the entire continent free land for the taking, open skies, right? We didn't take into consideration that in order to get this land, we literally had to wipe people off the face of the earth to get it. Or in Europe, when they colonized Africa, the narratives and the stories were about finding resources, conquering the rainforests, subduing the savanna grasslands, fighting and killing and taking game as trophies. Never did they talk about the vanquishing of whole civilizations in Africa in order to do that. And the same as it goes in Asia. So we got histories that were largely written by white wealthy men from a European or American perspective. So we call this Eurocentric history. And oftentimes, much of the history, as we've seen with Patrick Henry and Paul Revere and George Washington, was largely fabricated. So for an example, we fought three wars against the Seminole Indians in Florida in the early 19th century. You probably were never taught about those wars because the United States lost those wars. So they just were simply never mentioned in any of the history books I ever had in elementary school and in high school, simply because the United States wanted to wipe out the fact that, yeah, before Vietnam, we had lost wars. So from this perspective, we have also an idea called revisionist history. So largely what has been taking place over the last 50 years in Europe and in the United States and basically the West is the rewriting of history largely to correct a lot of the Eurocentric history. We call this revisionist history. Sometimes revisionist history gets a bad name because there are people who say that we shouldn't tamper with something that happened in the past. Once the history is written, we ought to leave it alone. And largely, those are people who are trying to protect their positions. Revisionist history is going back, reconceptualizing the data, and, think about, and thinking about the data from an altogether new perspective. So, some of the work that we will do will be looking at this concept of revisionist history and Eurocentric history. We also have this thing that we call history from the bottom up. And what we mean by this is social history. This is one of the most important fields of history in that since history was often written by wealthy white males, they wrote about wars and generals and presidents and leaders. They didn't necessarily write about ordinary people. So as an example, they might write a history book about General Patton 
but forget about the history of ordinary soldiers who were actually engaged in battle. Or what they do, what they might write about is George Washington and his father's cherry tree, but not talk about so much the slaves who picked all of the cherries. So what we've been doing for the last number of years, I would say about 25 to 30 years, is trying to write alternative narratives of history where we consider everyone who has a story to tell. Now, sometimes this is problematic because oftentimes people who are poor and marginalized don't have the means necessary or the time and energy to write their own particular reflections. So what we have are these concepts of Eurocentric history that are completely being pushed aside in favor of revisionist history, where we are correcting all of the things that were wrong in history, and we are trying to find ways of bringing in those alternative voices. We also have this concept that we've been talking about a little bit in this lecture about oral versus written history. So we talked about the idea about the telephone line where we say one thing and then it changes versus we think in the West that if it's written down and I've showed you an example that we can do the telephone with written and it changes as well. But what we've been doing over the last number of years is that we've been trying to elevate the idea of oral history on the same level as written history and saying that both are equally flawed at times and that one should not take, let's say, precedence over another. Many historians today, like myself, I use oral histories as a means to find out more about people. So, for example, it's easier sometimes to interview people than it is to have them write their own histories, okay? Now, what are the materials that historians use? Foremost, what historians use as data are what we call primary sources. There's no need to define what primary is, but as you can see by the word here, it is the essential document that historians use. We generally give it this kind of a definition. A primary source is a first-hand eyewitness account of the event. So if you and I were on the opposite sides of those streets and we wrote down what we saw or we talked about it into a microphone and put it on tape or CD or something, that would be a primary source because we had first-hand accounts. Anything that was there at the beginning is a primary source. Now, let's say that I was standing on one side of the street and I wrote down or talked in my recollections about what happened, and then you picked up my sources, my written material or the recording, and then you wrote about what I stated or wrote, that would be called a secondary source. So the most important documents that historians use are primary sources. The second most important source that historians use are, you guessed it, secondary sources. Here is Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. This is his own handwriting when he wrote out his speech. This is a primary source. Now, why is it important that this is a primary source? is because if you look carefully, you can see where he scratched out words and made changes. So I can see what Lincoln was thinking at the time period, and maybe there are words that he decided to change that altered the text. So if I'm going to write a book about Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, I'm going to refer to this primary source. When I am finished, I'm going to have a book about Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, which will be a secondary source. Now, both of these types of sources are important to historians. Historians use both primary and secondary sources, but primary sources are most valuable and the single greatest thing that you have. 
If you're a historian and you want to write about a particular event and there are no primary sources about that event, that's not considered legitimate history writing. It may be politics. It may be something else, sociology, but it is definitely not history. These are also sources. This is the Parthenon sitting on top of the Acropolis in Greece. This is a primary source because architectural historians can learn a lot about this building and about the Greeks just from looking at it. Below are the first pyramids ever constructed in the world. And these are in the Sudan, not in Egypt. Why these are important is because they began to work out the basics of the pyramid building here and then later took them to Egypt and then built the Great Pyramids in Egypt. So we can learn about how pyramid building began by looking at these particular pyramids. And of course, things like vases that are discovered by archeologists, etc., are important. This is a rock that has been turned over by a group of anthropologists and probably archeologists, and it's got some hieroglyphics written in it. We would have to look at and determine whether or not the writing on that stone was either a secondary or primary source. We'd have to learn how to read it. One thing that you will notice on this rock is that there are green things, right? Moss, as we say. They're actually called lichens. Those lichens are primary sources. Why are they primary sources? We can actually take those lichens and carbon date them and figure out approximately when maybe this stone might have been turned over or carved, right? Because certainly the carvings came first and then the lichens came later, right? So we can get some rough approximations of dates by doing that. Now, what does it require to become a historian? Generally speaking, it requires that a person have some education in history, but we generally say that a person is not a historian until they are either engaged in the writing of serious history or they have doctorates in history. You can get a history degree at the bachelor's level, and that usually takes four years, two years of general studies, which if you're at a community college, you're getting, and then beyond that, you're getting two years of history courses. So you might take a course in American history, the Revolutionary War, the French history. You might take a course in Vietnam War. You might take maybe six or seven history courses that will give you just a general firm understanding of history more than what an average person. So you would know more history, let's say, than a person who had a degree in sociology or engineering or mathematics. But we generally don't call people who have bachelor's degrees historians, right? We, we generally reserve that a little bit later. Now, you can earn a master's degree in history, what we usually call an MA, a Master of Arts in History, or a Master of Science in History. And usually the Master of Science in History is usually for those people who are getting degrees in conservation, looking to preserve things or historic preservation. The master's in history generally takes about two years of study at about 36 units, which will culminate in a thesis or an examination. A thesis is about a document of about 100 pages, and what you are doing is just making an argument about something. And you can use some primary sources, but you can literally write a thesis with almost all secondary sources. It's just a thesis. It's a thesis statement flushed out greater than what you would have in a general paper. Then you also have to have, usually typically in most MA programs, competency in a language. Doesn't matter what language it is, but if you are, let's say, going to study European history, you probably might want to have French or Italian or German or something to that nature. If you were doing African history, you probably might want to get in Nkosa, Swahili, or any uh, other number of um, languages in Africa. 
Um, so if you were doing your research on Mexico, you probably want to speak Spanish in Brazil. You probably want to speak Portuguese, right? And sometimes you can have a research tool like learning how to do oral histories will substitute for a language. Now, here comes the harder degree, and this is the Doctorate of Philosophy in History. This takes about 72 units and can be broken up in two phases. You can first do your first 36 units and get a master's degree, and then do another 36 units and get a PhD. Usually, the time that it requires to get those additional 36 units is a, an additional four to five more years. So if you do the full 72 units, it's going to take you about five years just to get through the coursework. Then you're going to have a language, three subject matter examination, and a dissertation. So the coursework that you're going to take for your master's and PhD are the same. You're going to take a course in, let's say, the Revolutionary War. You're going to take a course in the French Revolution. You're going to take a course in Asian history. You're going to take just a lot of courses that are going to prepare you for your subject matter examination and your dissertation. So, for example, my education and my doctorate was in American history. So I took a lot of courses in things like the Revolutionary War. I took a course on the Vietnam War, uh, the Cold War. I took courses on, let's say, the Civil War etc. Now, my language, even though I was doing American history, and I didn't necessarily need a foreign language to study American history, I still had to do a language, and so the language that I chose was Spanish, because it just seemed to be there might be some things here in the United States at some point that might be written in Spanish, and so I thought that I needed to have a working language. So you'll have to take an examination in Spanish. You'll also have to specialize in three subjects. Doesn't matter what those subjects are. Hopefully those subjects are going to be in the field that you're interested in. So, for example, I am a social historian, and I did uh, a subject matter in African-American intellectual history, and then I did my third one in cultural heritage, historic preservation, because I have a background, as you'll see, in... Uh, architecture and civil engineering. So I was, for a job, I was doing uh, historic preservation, so I did one in cultural heritage. You will be examined on these three subjects. So in some cases, the exams are take home. They'll give you some questions, and you'll take them home, and you'll do them. And sometimes it's all in an office. So mine were by memory in an office. And so the exams last usually about 12 to 13 hours, so you're going to be writing all day. They're really difficult exams, and you have to know the subject matter well. And what do we mean by this is, is that let's just say you're going to do yours on the Civil War. You will have to read every single book that was ever written on the Civil War and understand what those books are. You should be able to, when you're done, someone should be able to just go on your list and pick out a book and say, what's this book about? And you should be able to talk about it. After you pass those examinations, you're going to have an oral examination and somebody's going to quiz you on areas that they think might think you might have not done so well on, and you'll have to defend yourself. Then once you've passed that, then you'll move on to write the dissertation. A dissertation is writing a book. It's not like a thesis. It is a regular size book. That may take you anywhere from one to five years to write. Five years to, is about right. And literally, sometimes you might spend, it took me 10 years to finish. It, that's the average, is about nine to 10 years to get a PhD. All the way from coursework to the end. And once you get it, you will be called a historian. So now you can see that why history is complicated. And so what we're taught at the PhD level is to be able to take a source, to look at it, to understand it. But we've been doing this for such a long time, right? In college, I learned how to look at primary sources. And so here, you're going to begin your journey. Now, no one's going to expect that you have a thorough understanding of all the primary sources, 
me at this particular point in my career, someone can tell me that there's a primary source about something and I don't even have to see it. I can tell you whether or not whether, whether it's worth anything just by you describing it. But this is what it requires to get a PhD in history. Now, once you get a PhD in history, you are then eligible to go teach at a college or university. There are, in some cases, people who have master's degrees who are competent enough that they teach at universities. There are a few of them, not many. Most of the people who, have, who teach at community colleges only have master's degrees. Because the thinking here is, is that, well, it's only two years and you don't have to really teach anything that's really in-depth or hard. So if you don't have a PhD, that's fine. Me personally, I don't think that that's appropriate. I think that you should have a PhD in history to teach anywhere. But we do have several people who don't have PhDs who teach in the social science department at City College. But nevertheless, to be considered a credible history professor or any professor at any university, community college or anywhere else, you need a PhD. Now, there are history specializations. I've talked about one. There is social history. There are historians who don't do anything but write about politics, right? And what we mean by this, they look back at political history, constitutional history, ethnic history, African-American, Chicano, Asian, you name it, Aboriginal history, African history, people who do women's history, trans history, economic history, intellectual history, any history that you can think of. When I was in graduate school, there was a woman who wrote her dissertation on uh, the Campfire Girls. I don't know if you know the Campfire Girls. If you're not, you can Google it. She wrote a dissertation on the Campfire Girls, right? It was interesting. So just to recap with sources and what you're going to need for this class, you need to know what a primary source is, what a secondary source is. And you're going to need to know what their importance is for history. All right, so let's conclude here. Your work this semester is to gain a deep understanding of American history through readings, both primary and secondary sources, and to make an attempt through a methodological approach. Good luck to you all.